Good evening, everyone. We're going to get started. I'm going to be very quick and hand this off uh, to other people. But I just want to say welcome. I am really excited about being able to do what we're doing tonight. And for those of you that aren't aware, um, Paul and Franco came, or I guess we started a conversation maybe a year or so ago and started talking about the relationship between technology and design. And it's a really interesting and exciting moment where we're co-sponsoring the lecture tonight and bringing both students and faculty and ideas from the two different colleges together and be able to start to do some, some events and things like this. So we're excited to be hosting it as part of our lecture series. And I guess I'll, you're gonna talk about what you guys are doing for your series, then we'll do an introduction, and then finally we'll have a lecture tonight, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's not going to be very long. Um, so it's really a pleasure for us to um, um, work with our College of Architecture um, in uh, this conjunct uh, effort to talk about uh, the relationship between uh, humanities uh, and technology. Um, technology is becoming, uh, it's always changing and the pace of change of technology is kind of amazing and sometimes it's very difficult for us to understand the big picture of uh, how and, uh, and, and why this technology is changing and, but we are living it, right? Sometimes we don't understand it very well and humanities, social sciences and uh, um, history, anthropology, <laughs> And many other fields uh, of the humanities in a broad sense of the term can really help us understand the big picture of the big changes that we are facing in the new industry, the smart industry that we are um, um, having lately, uh, autonomous driving, uh, the changes in the cities, the changes in our houses that are becoming smart, our fridges is not going to answer to us very kindly sometimes. They, 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 <laughs> and uh, our microwaves. Um, so we need to understand what's going on. Um, and uh, this is uh, the main goal of uh, our series, which is humanities and technology. And um, it's a conversation not only between uh, technologists and humanists, but it's a, it's a conversation between different entities, between the College of Art, um, uh, College of Art and Sciences, uh, the College of Architecture, the College of Engineering, uh, the Southfield Public Library now, and many other entities. Uh, and we hope to involve industry more and more. Um, so uh, it's a pleasure. Just uh, I will uh, spend a couple of seconds presenting the next the next um, um, talk that will be that with this such a uh, um, fascinating title, Asim of the Ice Moons of Saturn and New Humanities. Uh, this talk will be about um, the um, collaboration between very different um, fields in the understanding of, uh, in the investigation about, the, uh, about this unsaid Enceladus, which is uh, an ice moon of Saturn. So um, you, you can imagine how many different competences can be integrated in the understanding of uh, our problems of astrophysics. This is going to be um, our next, next talk. And so I will uh, give the floor to Paul to introduce our today's speaker. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, thank you both, Carl and Franco, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, it's a real pleasure to introduce Dr. Laura Forlano, who is an associate professor of design and um, at the Institute of Design and, if, and also an affiliated faculty in the College of Architecture at the Illinois Institute of Technology. Did you get that? Okay. Uh, where she is the director of the Critical Futures Lab. Uh, during the current academic year, she is visiting research fellow at the Digital Life Initiative at Cornell Tech in New York City, and she is also a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard University. In addition to these appointments, Dr. Forlano's work has been recognized through a Fulbright and funded by the National Science Foundation. Her research is focused on the aesthetics and politics of socio-technical systems and infrastructures at the intersection of emerging technologies, material practices, and the future of cities. Specifically, she writes about emergent forms of work, organizing, and urbanism. 
Uh, she has been published in numerous peer-reviewed journals, uh, far too many for me to list here, uh, but I do want to recommend one article that she wrote for the general public that you can easily find after this talk. It's entitled Invisible Algorithms, Invisible Politics, and it's available through the online journal Public Books. Uh, this article powerfully argues for the need to understand the materiality of computing, a materiality that reflects and re-encodes political and economic, economic inequalities that are actually often hidden by the very rhetoric, rhetoric of invisibility and seamlessness that often accompanies new technologies. It's a very interesting intervention, I think, into the question of uh, how these, these technologies are being framed and what they're covering up, even as they're claiming to be completely transparent, right? which I think is really great. So when I first read that piece, uh, I knew that Dr. Forlano was exactly the kind of thinker we wanted to feature at Humanity and Technology, and so I'm really pleased that she could join us tonight in this special collaboration with COAD. Uh, please join me in welcoming her. Thank you so much for the kind introduction and for having me as part of this lecture series. Um, likewise, when I saw the topic, I was like, that is the lecture series that I want to be in. So, um, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, so tonight, just to give you a bit of an overview, I'm going to talk about a project called Bauhaus Futures. I'm going to introduce some theories of the cyborg, the post-human, and the more than human. I'll touch on a few um, practice uh, research projects but that um, engage in design practice around the driverless city, reimagining work, code to wear, and intimate infrastructures. And then lastly, I'll end with some thoughts on uh, emerging methodologies for feminist futures. Um, so who am I? Well, I like to um, introduce myself by um, stating just some of my um, affiliations. I, I go by the she, her pronouns. I'm white, middle class, highly educated. I'm living with a disability. I'm privileged. I'm Italian American. I'm human, I think. And sometimes I go by the, the um, characterization of the d disabled cyborg in some of my writing. Um, and if you don't know much about Illinois Institute of Technology, um, I'd like to tell you that it was actually founded in 1937 by Laszlo Moholy-Nagy as the new Bauhaus. And it turns out that this year is the centennial of the Bauhaus School um, of Design, and, and it very much shaped architecture and design um, in, in Europe, around the world, and certainly in the United States. Um, and the, the Bauhaus was especially concerned with the aesthetics around mass production and the use of technology to improve the quality of human life. And here's an image of the Bauhaus building in Dessau, um, where I will be going in a couple of weeks to participate in their Bauhaus Festival, which is part of the centennial events. Um, and this is where the school was housed from 1925 to 1932, and the building was designed by Walter Gropius. Um, and then I'll, I'll show you some images of um, uh, the early work uh, that, of the Bauhaus, um, and, and very much um, the utopian ideals that motivated this work was really about figuring out who was the new human being. What kind of modern man did the Bauhaus envision would inhabit this world defined by technology? And what did he expect of it? What happens to the heart and soul, the mind and body, the individuality of a human when he and his environment are defined, rationalized, and standardized by technological, math mathematical, and scientific parameters? Might his sensibilities and creativity, his Productive, uh, productiveness and life energy been, be enacted um, by technological appliances. And that's to quote from the Bauhaus Dessau, um, a catalog for an exhibition that they had a few years ago called Human Space Machine Stage Experiments at the Bauhaus. Here are some additional images um, that were done. Um, this idea of the natural man located in abstract space, um, this mechanical and rational understanding of the body versus an organic and emotional understanding, uh, the tension between utopianism and utilitarianism. And this image um, was by um, Oscar Schlemmer, one of the early Bauhaus teachers. A lot of these uh, vi images that you'll see are, are thinking about um, actually theater and the ways of positioning the body in space, such as on a stage. Um, and you'll see this one specifically. Um, this is Shanti Shawinsky's design for the robber ballet scene. Um, it's a scene in a ballet of Shakespeare's Two Gentlemen of Verona, and it was done in 1925. Um, and this one is the, figure cab cab the Figural Cabinet by Oscar Schlemmer. Um, and this one, you might you know, recognize some of these uh, kinds of 
uh, fashion and sort of uh, experimental uh, festive uh, costumes. So this is a group of performers from Triadish Ballet by Oscar Schlemmer as well. And this last one is um, a piece by Shanti Shawinsky called Step Dancer versus Step Machine uh, from 1926. And I think it nicely characterizes this, you know, human and machine relations. Um, and so I, I, I set that as kind of the, the background to the talk. Um, so the, the Bauhaus were really concerned with this idea, as I said, the new man, and it was at the time uh, the new man. Uh, the, the women of the Bauhaus were typically uh, delegated to the weaving studios. Um, and this tension between art and technology, the artists and craftsmen, uh, the monumental and ornamental, creativity and experimentation, form follows function, simplicity and unity. And Walter Gropius um, in, in the Bauhaus Manifesto of 1919 said, together let us desire, conceive, and create this new structure of the future. And as I mentioned, it's now the 100th anniversary of the Bauhaus School. And when I think about it, um, given my interest in design and technology, I think that we've succeeded in designing a black box of technology within a white box of design, of modernism, right? And if you look around at the aesthetics even today, you will see a lot of these clean, white, simple, modernist kinds of, of designs. Um, so with that in mind, uh, a couple of years ago, I, I embarked on a project uh, to create an edited book on Bauhaus Futures. Um, it's going to be published this fall by MIT Press, um, co-edited uh, with Molly Wright Steenson of CMU and Mike Anany of USC. And in it, um, we asked the question, what would keep the Bauhaus up at night if it were practicing today? So we're very ex uh, interested in the experimentalism and the artistic um, aspect of the Bauhaus and whether or not things like algorithms or biotech might become the new materials of design. Um, and I'll just point out two of the over 25 pieces in the book. Um, Mitch McEwen, an architect at Princeton, uh, her piece called Negro Bauhaus, and, and she says that the ways in which the Bauhaus frames everyday life as a problem to which science, invention, and technology and computation offer possible responses. And she analyzes what she calls the problem of the problem, engaging the ways in which the United States invented the Negro as a problem, and as such can be understood as our Bauhaus. And one of the things that we wanted to do in the book was deliberately highlight um, gender, race, social justice, and other concerns, which we think are you know, absolutely critical for design departments and architecture departments to be thinking about today. I'll point out one other piece, and this is called the Salvo's Diagrams for Another Bauhaus. And some of you might be familiar with the original Bauhaus curriculum diagram. And what Carl's done in this piece is create three um, potential curriculums. One of them very much focuses on technologies such as VR and AR. The next um, very much on um, these notions of, of becoming, on economy, um, and on sustainability on the third one. So, so this is a really interesting, I think, platform for the potential revision of design education today, um, thinking about, um, as he calls them, a post-digital Bauhaus, a Bauhaus for the Anthropocene, a, and a post-capitalist Bauhaus. Um, so much of my work for the last 10 years has been about how do you study people, things, and societies that don't exist yet? Hence the title of my Critical Futures Lab. Um, and how do you create alternative possible futures? What kinds of design and designers will be needed? And it's very much at the intersection of these four topics um, that Paul mentioned when he introduced me. And some of the, the technologies that I've looked at have been smart cities and autonomous vehicles, distributed and integrated design practices, automation in the future of work, local manufacturing and digital fabrication, mobile work practices, smart textiles and computational fashion, and networked medical devices. So here you see a theme that I've been very much captured by the ways in which the digital has been manifest in the physical world. Um, and this is you know, going back to 
2005 when I was working on my dissertation research. Um, and at that time, things like ubiquitous computing, you know, were, were still, you know, nascent uh, communities and, and conversations. So I've kind of followed that and, and ch deliberately chosen topics that allowed me to understand these kind of new digital materialities. And if you look at um, a number of the field sites that I've studied, but just in everyday uh, mainstream media reporting or even in scholarship or in um, Silicon Valley claims, for example, about the benefits of technology, you often see this idea about um, connecting to the future, um, which is an image from the, the University of Michigan M-City testbed for autonomous vehicles, the future today, um, an image from the UI labs in Chicago, and make the future here um, from the Brooklyn Fashion Design Accelerator affiliated with Pratt Institute. So these ideas about the future are, are constantly circulating. Um, and the kinds of projects I'm interested in are those that really bring this kind of a critical dialogue informed by social science theory and humanities theory um, in conjunction with a practice of generative and inventive and speculative methodologies. So if you look at um, Bruno Latour's article from 2004, Why Has Critique Run Out of Steam? He says, the critic is not one who debunks, but one who assembles. So he's very much pushing back against the humanities and social science fields tendency to stay within the realm of, of description and critique. Um, and he starts talking about these more uh, inventive methods. And in fact, um, that article was timed also with a large exhibition called Making Things Public, which produced a catalog that was about this thick. And it was one of the first times that you could see social scientists from the science and technology studies field participating in uh, an exhibition. And that was held in Karlsruhe, Germany. Um, and so there are a number of really interesting uh, projects. And that has actually now, I would say, grown, and a lot of the major conferences now have a making and doing track where you can showcase not only presented papers, but physical prototypes, exhibitions, activist work, and things that have a kind of um, different materiality and a different, different purpose. And continuing on with that thought about um, science and technology studies, the field has um, some general language that's used, and, and typically it's talked about moving from matters of fact, which, which essentially means scientific fact and the way scientists understand their work, to matters of concern, which are basically the ways in which social scientists like to tell the stories about what happens in the lab or um, you know, in, um, in Silicon Valley, um, the ways in which it takes many stakeholders working in a network to shape an issue like climate change or artificial intelligence. So all of these actors are participating in the construction of socio-technical imaginaries. And that comes out in scholarship, in the mainstream media, in design prototypes and practice. Um, and one recently, um, uh, Puy, de la Casa, uh, Puy de la Bella Casa has um, introduced this idea of matters of care. It's very much tied to, um, to ideas about speculation, um, working, working in these more inventive and generative ways, and it really brings a feminist approach. Um, if you think about it, care is something that um, women's labor and also you could say immigrant labor is often bound up in caring for the aging or caring for children. But at the same time, you know, her own work is uh, on soil science and she talks a lot about, um, you know, care as an ethics that's different, a uh, different kind of way of relating to the world. Um, and within, um, as I mentioned, there's been this really interesting inventive turn in the social sciences and humanities where um, people are not content only with uh, describing the world, but they actually want to get out and start doing things. And it's, it's what's known as a critical technological praxis, critical making, material speculation, conceptual matter, the post-critical, practice-based research, design as inquiry, research creation, speculative fabulation, critical media practices, critical data practices, experiential futures, and Afrofuturism. So there's a huge number of types of methodologies that are being constantly invented um, in, as a way of, um, as Nortia Mares and her colleagues would say, inventing the social. 
So we don't only describe the world, but we actually actively participate in the world. Um, and I would say it's still a, a nascent conversation. It's by um, no means a, a mainstream conversation, but it is certainly growing and very active. So some of the projects I'll uh, show you today, I would say fall within this general inventive turn within the social sciences. And one of the claims that I've made um, you know, with this poster, for example, um, uh, is that design research has actually failed to re redesign itself and that there's still a lot of work to be done to rethink what those new curriculums of design need to be. Um, and my approach has generally been to work across disciplines, across scales, across modes and methodologies, and across these human and non-human boundaries that I'll talk about in detail today. So some of the concepts that I'll introduce, um, certainly the, the cyborg, um, both the original meaning and a, the more updated meaning, uh, the post-human versus the post-human. Um, so the post-human with, with the dash is really more aligned with a very techno-determinist notion of kind of moving beyond human capability, uh, such as the transhuman or singularity movement. And the post-human without the dash is, is a more general term that is going to be uh, related to a lot of the, the scholarship I'm going to introduce. Um, and then the more than human is another characterization, and it seems to be gaining in popularity because it avoids the, the dilemma of you know, getting confused between which kind of post-humanism uh, we're talking about. So to start, uh, Donna Haraway's Cyborg Manifesto, published in 1991, um, she really uh, appropriates the concept of the cyborg um, from a more techno-deterministic and militaristic version. And she uses it to talk about the ways in which Western Enlightenment thinking, and to a great degree, the way we organize society has been um, very much uh, split into kind of binaries. So the local versus the global, the human versus the non-human, nature versus culture. Um, and she tries to bring those things together with this um, figure of the cyborg. And I would say that this um, conversation around design um, has, you know, and this, the, the notion of the cyborg, the post-human, or the more than human has actually um, been proliferating at design conferences over the last few years. So um, in preparation for the Istanbul Design Biennial, for example, um, the, the curator said, to talk about design is to talk about the state of our species. Um, and they had uh, actually a book that was produced called Are We Human? Um, and they say that the state of design today when everyday reality has outpaced science fiction. Um, so design makes the human, but it also engineers inequalities such that design itself needs to be redesigned, quoting Keller Easterling. Um, and, and it's a really great, design is a great area in which to look at the human as well as the possibilities of the more than human. Um, and Easterling argues that within this narrow framework of, of the human, design can be about the total extension of rationality into the surrounding environment with universal systems of proportion or geometry that make claims to natural laws. But design can also be about extending our own powers of that nervous system. There are so many underexploited faculties of voice, skin, skeleton, muscles, and interplay with other solids, photons, and waves. The more than human doesn't negate human design. It only multiplies those designs in a larger field so that there are always many instead of only one. So it's very much you know, also arguing for this socio-technical systems view of, of, of our relations with the world and with technology. So there, there are two critical reasons that we need to start thinking about the, the concept of the post-human and the more than human. You know, one is emerging technology and the other is climate change. So with respect to emerging technology, certainly you know, one of the uh, technological advancement that's on everyone's mind is artificial intelligence, algorithms, and machine learning. Um, it's on the cover of you know, almost every news source lately, and there's a lot of discussion about these ideas of algorithmic bias, the way that algorithms and other technologies simply are reflections of our existing structural inequalities in society. 
and whether that be race, gender, disability, or other ways in which we structure the world um, in favor of some and, and to the disadvantage of others. And this is what I've written about in the Invisible Algorithms, Invisible Politics piece for pu public books. Um, the other reason is certainly climate change. And, you know, probably many people saw this headline that the world was just issued a 12-year ultimatum on climate change um, and that we really have to begin figuring this out, um, changing our habits, our behaviors. Um, and, you know, one uh, example of why a concept like the posthuman might be useful um, is here. New Zealand, um, they actually granted a river the same legal rights as a human being. So that allows you to have a legal way of protecting natural resources. So we need to move from sort of a traditional human-centered design orientation um, that focuses on the human, the user, the singular, uh, the individual, users as subjects, users as consumers, and move towards the understanding of human-non-human -human relations, user-non-user uh, -user relations, singular and multiple um, identities, for example. So instead of you know, identifying only as, say, male or female or um, uh, disabled or non-disabled, for example, this idea of intersectionality, that people have multiple identities that shape their experience in the world, um, using Kim Crenshaw's term. Um, also figuring out ways of working um, that bridge individual and collaborative um, knowledge and practice. Um, starting to give users uh, the role as participants rather than merely being subjects of our design research. And starting to think about users as potentially repairers of their own products and services and, and worlds rather than merely consumers. So I'll touch on um, five bodies of research within these ideas about the post-human. Um, actor network theory, feminist new materialism, speculative realism and object-oriented ontology, non-representational geography, and transhumanism. And I'll just give you a taste of each one before I move on to some of the empirical examples and design projects. And I've written about both of these things in, in recent articles, so you can certainly delve in if you want to read more. But that first body of literature, um, actor network theory, it's very well captured by uh, the work of Bruno Latour, but also others in the field of science and technology studies. Um, and the main uh, learning here is to think about the world and the relations um, between networks of humans and non-humans that share equal agency in participating and shaping in issues. So according to Latour, um, and th th these ideas are actually emergent in the, the late 1980s, um, as a way to try to understand the role of objects and things. And um, he's quoted as saying, it was at this point that non-humans, microbes, scallops, rocks, and ships presented themselves to social theory in a new way. In this view, objects such as seat belts and door grooms or door closers are the missing masses that stand in for human actors and embed specific socio-political values and ethical commitments, enrolling humans in certain programs of action. Uh, and the next body of theory is feminist new materialism, um, captured well by Rosie Bright Dottie's work um, in her book, The Post-Human, but also you know, a community of scholars that are working in this tradition. Um, it shares a lot of similarity with a science and technology studies approach, although uh, many scholars are also participating uh, more in the humanities rather than the social sciences. Um, and I think the main difference um, really for the feminist new materialists is that they very clearly um, have kind of a, a critical post-humanism, which um, they really integrate post-structuralism, feminism, post-colonial theory into their work. They take racism, sexism, uh, colonialism, and classism very seriously. And actor network theory, on the other hand, is often critiqued for not being political enough, for being kind of apolitical, even though its main goal is to discover the politics that are sort of present within, um, within the, the, the laboratory or the, the topics that are being studied. Um, and feminist new materialism is the point of view that I align with most closely um, because of my interest in those issues as well. 
Uh, the third uh, body of research is really this ob object-oriented ontology, and OOO puts things at the center of being. Um, we humans are elements, but not the sole elements of philosophical interest. OOO contends that nothing has special status, but everything exists equally. Plumbers, cotton, bonobos, DVD players, and sandstone, for example. So this is a quote from Ian Bogost's book on alien phenomenology. Um, and the fourth um, body of theory is, is non-representational geography. This is well um, illustrated by Nigel Thrift's work. Um, he's really interested in new kinds of sensing technologies that construct the world as a surface in continuous motion, a world always almost there and thus always el elastic in the ways it leans into the moment, a world of infinite mobilization. Um, and non-representational geography basically looks at geography that isn't about studying maps, but studying things like sensors and social media and, and other ways that uh, we, we structure geographies. Um, and there's more to say about it, but I think that, um, that it will come up perhaps later in the talk as we, as we get to questions as well. And lastly, this um, probably most extreme version is, is transhumanism and human enhancement. So some of you might have seen this film Transcendence, um, but this idea that uh, the transitional human, it's a time when humans will transcend our biology through technology um, using biotech, biotech and computational enhancement. So for example, the singularity is a movement that has like a membership organization um, and the whole idea is that you know humans will eventually upload themselves into a computer or that we will somehow ultimately merge and they're you know kind of paying members that very much believe in this this perspective or this hope for for the for humans but so what if we were to think about design from the perspective of what a chicken wants or what an algorithm wants so this is about really de the decentering of the human as the focus of our design work, thinking about design as a socio-technical systems, and then even looking at the agencies of other kinds of actors like chickens or algorithms. And some of the key questions that I think that this raises is really who or what are the users and for whom or what should design be desirable? How and in what ways are capabilities, agency, and power distributed across human machines and natural systems? What new knowledges, questions, stakeholders, and partnerships are needed in order to adequately design for this problem? And how are ethics, values, and responsibilities reflected and embedded through the design process? Now, I should say that, that in addition to this focus on post-humanism, um, the post-human and the more than human, there are a number of really important critiques of this approach. And I, these are um, two recent books that, that I think are helpful. Um, but basically, the, the idea here is that, you know, one of the Marxist or fem feminist critiques that is made is that technologies are um, alienating our bodies. Um, and in science fiction, you often see very celebratory images of technology. Um, and so the idea here is that there are many people for which the category of the human ha you know, has excluded them. So people with disabilities, um, different racial groups, women. You know, so throughout history, we can look at ways in which people are given, you know, have a totally different experience of the world and are not given the same kinds of, of benefits um, based on, on their, uh, their background. And so that's, that's one of the most important criticisms, and I think it's, it's a really useful one, but I will also say that some of the writers, um, even in the kind of critical race studies, critical disability studies, are actually playing in their speculative fiction with ideas about technology in a more generous and kind of optimistic way. So I wouldn't say that they, you know, they, it's not all about critiquing technology, but, but it's important to note. So with that, I'm going to move on to some examples of projects that I've done. Um, the first one is around these more-than-human landscapes and autonomous vehicles. 
So a couple of years ago, I was funded with a group of colleagues at IIT to look at autonomous vehicles and uh, urban um, centers, and in particular this project, the driverless city was one of 53 projects, um, and it was selected to, to get a grant from the university. And one of the things that we did in that project is to kind of map out some of the possibilities of, of um, where did we think autonomous vehicles were gonna play a role in urban environments. And um, according to my collaborator, Marshall Brown, he said, um, we're trying to get beyond technological determinism um, and stop waiting around for an answer to the question of what driverless technology will do to our cities and instead think about what kind of urban space do we want in 30 years or in 40 years or in the future. And I think we know that architecture and urban planning are very long-term um, practices. Like you have to plan a long time to, to really get your, your visions built into the world. Um, Here's a, a bit of a close-up of that, um, that mind map that we created, and it, it identified several opportunity areas that we could work on, um, and we created a speculative video for each of these, and I'll show one of them today. But first, I wanna start with a field note from the future. Oh, and I'm missing my notes for that one. That's, that's unfortunate. Okay, I, th I think I'm gonna miss <laughs> Okay, let me play the video, then I might come back to the notes. By 2036, pockets of Chicago and new centers Naperville and Joliet had become so congested with last mile delivery vehicles that aerial drones began replacing autonomous vehicle delivery, thus reducing the need for the sprawling warehousing and distribution centers that populated the Chicago metropolitan area throughout the 20th century. Class one railroads, originally the key to Chicago's role as a center of manufacturing and distribution, have been largely superseded by platoons of autonomous trucks and truck trains up to several miles in length. The North American Land Bridge, running from Los Angeles to New York via Chicago, is the last remaining profitable railroad that hasn't transformed into a development company. It is owned and operated by UPCSX, a merger of the Union Pacific and CSX railroads. To maintain profitability, double-stack container trains traveling the corridor reach up to three miles in length. Former trackage, their rights-of-way and intermodal freight facilities are still owned by BNSF, CN, and other companies, but now they lie fallow, serving as ad hoc nature preserves and wildlife corridors, as nature reclaims the formerly active transportation corridors. Platooning vans disperse regionally to irrigate markets with fresh produce. At the same time, electronics, furniture, and even autonomous vehicles produced through the vast global supply chain are also ubiquitous. The need for social connection and the demand for hyper-specialized goods has assured the viability of in-place retailing throughout the region. Purchases made in person can be located and transferred from a truck house and delivered within minutes or hours to any location. Persistent trade imbalances with China and Southeast Asia have led to networked markets for recycling. UPCSX fills empty containers with waste products for return trips. The consequent closing of landfills has therefore become a significant planning challenge for public authorities, hoping to recoup some value from those sites. With the ability to detect potential collisions, including wildlife, from long distances, roadkill has become largely a thing of the past, thus contributing to overpopulation of certain species. In response to homeowners' complaints about deer, coyotes, and other large mammals, the states of Illinois, Michigan, and Indiana relaxed regulation and opened new areas of hunting throughout the territory. Many former drivers and warehouse workers have developed seasonal hunting and trapping services. They supply on-demand food with fresh meats, catering to the public's appetite for regionally specific foods. The popularity of locally sourced cuisine contrasted greatly with the nearly complete outsourcing of most other forms of production. The vast tracts of warehouses abandoned by industrial property developers and third-party logistics companies have also proven to be fertile ground for many gray market industries. These vast landscapes of exchange, born in the 19th century, had served their purpose and now needed a new role to play in the 21st century. Once separated from our cities and hidden from view, 
they became testing grounds for new forms of production and civic life. Okay. So just so that you understand it correctly, these, the speculative videos are intended not as prescriptions or predictions of what urban life will be like, but a proposition to raise a question. Sometimes the purpose is to give you a, a dystopian or nuanced or utopian vision, so it's something that, that you can respond to or argue with, right? And so that's generally the, the purpose of these kind of works, but they're not always understood in that context. So I thought it's uh, worth mentioning. Um, and I'll come back to the field note from the future at the end if, I, if, um, if there's time, but I want to move ahead. Um, so another project that I've been involved with um, over uh, a couple of years ago is this um, project on the future of work uh, that I conducted with Megan Halpern, who's a professor at Michigan State University. Um, and this was a project that was funded by the Open Society Foundation. Um, and we created a, a game that actually went um, 3,000 years into history, and it looked at the relations between different cultures and societies and the kinds of technologies that were used to manage work. So one of the examples was for a, a water clock. So the, as the water poured through, that would be how humans would measure how long they were working. Um, and so what we did is we created a game that took about two hours to play. We invited about 30 uh, social justice activists, designers, scholars um, to, to, to come to work with us that day. Um, and then following the, the playing of the game in which we had to invent um, historical examples, what we call um, counterfactuals, um, we actually uh, led into a prototyping activity where participants created um, the kinds of technologies that would uh, advocate for their workers, their constituents. So these were, for example, um, groups that were um, helping to protect care workers, uh, um, immigrant workers, um, and others. And so these fictional technologies that they created were ways of uh, working through the, the ethical dilemmas, um, the politics around technology, and, and you know, both their hopes and fears around technology and how it's impacting um, workers. So that's, that's the second project I wanted to mention. Um, the third pro project is this one on um, sort of thinking about the ways in which we collaborate with ma machines. So this idea of post-human collaboration and computational fashion. Um, this was a project that I did with two fashion designers. Um, it was a summer project, and what we learned is that um, instead of modeling uh, a fashion piece um, in a 2D model um, and translating that into a 3D model and then 3D printing that, we actually had to learn how to let the algorithm or the software participate in our design practice. So those of you from architecture might be familiar with you know, computational design and architecture, and this is very similar, but it was applied to a, uh, a, a garment that we were gonna print. And, um, and what we found in, in experimenting with this technology um, was that you know, some of our first prototypes just came out like spaghetti. Um, you could not you know, put them on a mannequin. They clearly, you know, we had the parameters wrong. Um, so it was really a way of us learning um, that we had to continually modify our design um, in participation with the computational software that we we're using. And here's an image of that, the final piece, and it was um, envisioned as a men's dress shirt. And you can see that it, it really reflects uh, a number of the, those, um, those binaries that I mentioned at the beginning, but you know, the, this idea of, of craft um, and materials and, and sort of gender and all of them kind of bound up in, in this object, which was exhibited um, at iBeam in New York as part of a, a show on computational fashion. Um, in 2015. Uh, another more recent project I've been able to study and, and uh, learn from is one called Tech Tiles. This was done at Pratt Institute's uh, Brooklyn Fashion Design Accelerator in their summer program. And the idea was to bring together designers with different kinds of backgrounds, uh, fashion design, materials engineering, uh, product design and programming um, in an integrative design practice in order to produce 30 swatches for smart textiles. And importantly, they were using a, a digital knitting um, machine in addition to 
um, you know, electronics and other kinds of things. So here you have a selection of the swatches that were produced. Um, so, so they allow you to kind of act on the fabric using a zipper as an actuator. So if you move the zipper, that would, you know, kind of be the computational like on off or a touch screen. So, so each of those swatches was um, conceived as, as a smart textile. Um, so that was another interesting project that I think illustrated these, how these boundaries around the human and machine are co continually shifting with each prototype, with each device that's created. Um, so finally, this example uh, of post-human subjectivity um, and network medical devices. So this is a project that I capture as part of this work on intimate infrastructures. It's a way of kind of con connecting the, the body with the world, um, not only through net network devices, but also just through um, thinking in, in socio-technical systems again, thinking about how you yourself are situated within these wider complex systems. Um, and I refer to um, a, you know, a part of this project as situated algorithmic actions, um, encountering the more than human in the middle of the night. Um, and this draws on Lucy Suchman's work on situated action, which was first introduced to actually understand the way humans work with copy machines. So she is a sociologist and, and based at um, Xerox Park uh, right after she finished her dissertation, um, and uh, or actually while she was working on her dissertation. And this whole idea that you know th these companies like Xerox Park have these plans and these these procedures and these ambitions that are often quite out of sync with the day-to-day -day lives of, of the users of these technologies, right? Um, and so this idea of you know how do humans uh, in their various contexts and services, how do they uh, in circumstances, how do they actually achieve the actions that they want? And so she has a really famous video of employees from Xerox Park kind of standing around this copy machine and they're like, oh, you know, what, print, turn over? And they can't figure out how to use it even though they work for Xerox Park. So she calls that the kind of situated actions of the human in contrast to the bureau bureaucratic plans of the company. Um, and what I think is interesting about revisiting this term now is because with networked medical devices and in particular the latest um, versions of these, um, the algorithms themselves are allowing these devices to have something called auto mode or automated mode, in which case the, the devices themselves are responding dynamically in situated contexts, um, not according to say only the plans of the company, but also um, the programming, which is often fed by the data from the user. So it's a very different relationship between the human and the machine. Um, and these are some of the concepts that I've developed in, in my work around this topic. But I can introduce to you, for example, my insulin pump and glucose meter and a lot of the other technologies that are required in order to manage um, chronic disease and disability. And I'm just going to read to you one um, vignette uh, from this research um, to give you a better sense of, of the latest problems um, around uh, thinking about human and machine uh, interactions. And this is the latest version of this device. All right. So in late November, I noticed that the pla pla black plastic casing of my insulin pump was cracking so much so that a neat circular piece of plastic had peeled neatly off the top where the insulin canister locked in place. The model had expired and I'd been receiving emails and calls from Medtronic for about six months. I called N, my representative, and after a 15 minute conversation decided to upgrade to the newest model described as the, the world's first hybrid closed loop system. According to the, oops, I'm sorry. According to the company, the Minimed 670G system offers SmartGuard, the only technology that mimics some of the functions of a healthy pancreas by providing two new levels of automated insulin delivery. I was about to leave town for winter break and an overseas vacation, and it was unclear whether the new model would be delivered in time, and explained to me that since some of the components of the new system were being manufactured in Puerto Rico. The company was experiencing delays in shipping due to the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. 
since I'd never really considered the relationship between climate change, colonialism, and the logistics and supply chains of medical device companies in the past, I found this interesting. The pump arrived about 48 hours before I left Chicago, and five days later, a box of sensors arrived in New York, a few hours before I left for Lisbon. This is only one of the many dile dilemmas of distributed living and working that continues to confound databases, customer service representatives, and large institutions. In any case, the new model required three in-person trainings. I opted to order a loaner pump through the company's travel program and as a backup in case my old one broke down completely while I was away. Fortunately, this did not happen. I wondered how much longer I could make do with the old pump, whether tape or superglue could hold it intact for a few more months or even years. When I returned from the holiday, I was excited to set up the new pump. On Friday night in early January, the 12th to be exact, I, I returned home from the year's first university faculty council meeting and had little planned for the evening. I took out the slim white boxes designed to look identical to Apple products. Within less than a year, I'd set up the new, I, I'm sorry, within less than an hour, <laughs> I had set up the new system, input the settings, and cast aside my old pump, which sat on the kitchen counter for well over a month before I sent it back to Medtronic. About 10 days later, on a Tuesday morning, after consulting several different manuals, all of them with simultaneously too much and not enough detail, I charged and inserted the new sensor and taped it to my stomach before heading to my first training, a one-hour appointment with a company rep to go over the features of the new pump. That Friday morning, my husband and I woke up earlier than usual to a loud but muffled beeping noise, which grew progressively louder as I lifted the comforter. As a heavy sleeper, I'd missed the two vibrating alarms that had preceded the beeping. The sensor needed to be calibrated every 12 hours, but could be paused for one hour increments. In order to calibrate the sensor, it's necessary to test your blood sugar with a glucose meter. One week later, on the following Tuesday morning, I was ready to set up auto mode. I wondered if there were times when I would need to turn it off, such as when exercising. Theoretically, you should never need to turn it off, said the company rep. While explaining the auto mode setting, we got to talking about the benefits of allowing an automated system to adjust insulin levels, adding insulin if blood sugar is too high, and suspending the delivery of insulin if blood sugar is too low. I wondered whether I might sleep through the night a bit better. The company rep responded, I met with a patient recently and described the new system, saying it was the best sleep of my life. That Sunday night, the day before an important day-long meeting, I woke at 2.30 a.m. to a buzzing, alerting me to calibrate the sensor. I paused it and was awakened promptly one hour later, and again one hour after that. That night, I was wakened no less than five times with various alerts of all kinds. I was groggy and delirious the following day. I made it through the day, having to excuse myself from meeting several times in order to calibrate the pump in order to stay in auto mode. By the end of the day, I was completely exhausted and frustrated. Three of my fingers on my left hand were purple and sore, each displaying a constellation of punctures, after pricking them ne nearly 30 times to calibrate the pump, as opposed to the usual twice a day. By Wednesday, February 7th, I've updated my Facebook status to idea for a new theory of media and technology, abusive technology. No matter how badly it behaves one day, we wake up the following day thinking it will be better, only to have our hopes and dreams crushed by disappointment. This post prompted an exchange about Lauren Berlant's cruel optimism, described as a relation or attachment in which something you desire is actually an ob obstacle to your own flourishing. By Tuesday, February 13th, I'd abandoned auto mode completely. While it's easy to critique technological systems, it's much harder to live intimately with them. With automated systems, and in particular with network medical devices, the technical and legal entanglements get in the way of more general, generous relations between humans and things. With my previous system, two technically incompatible but complementary devices that made for good companions in my care, I could flexibly adjust the temporal patterns according to my daily rhythms. While on the one hand, the devices had their own needs, battery, data, network, software, and hardware, on the, other day, I, uh, on the other hand, I could ignore the alerts and alarms when they were intrusive. With automated closed loop systems, more of the agency and control is deliberately entrusted to the device and the human is cast aside. 
For example, you cannot ignore the calibration alert for more than one hour at a time without turning off the sensor system completely. And this is according to um, regulatory and legal reasons related to getting this technology approved for use. You can't game the system. Humans are not trusted to do the right thing, but much of what is considered to be gaming the system from one perspective is what allows for the appropriation, flexibility, and participation in socio-technical systems to allow them to fit in with everyday lived experiences. So that, and then there's a selection of, of pieces if you want to read more. Um, and so I'll just close with some thoughts on the, the kinds of methodologies that are coming together around feminist design or feminist futures. Um, and I was very much inspired by the Frida Kahlo exhibition that I saw over the summer at the Victorian Albert Museum. And I think of her as a kind of one of the first feminist designers. Um, you know, because when we design, we're not designing images, things, products, or services, or buildings. Um, we're designing people. And you know, in my lab and also in my Designing Futures classes, we can say, see the ways in which the world unfolds when we make th things through the questions that we begin to ask in the, in the crits, for example. And Frida Kahlo very much, you know, in this, the exhibition titled Making Herself Up, is a great example of someone that was constantly inventing herself and also making things and, and artworks also that help her make sense of of her um, herself. So the first um, example of kind of a feminist uh, design approach um, I mentioned is Critical Fabulations, um, the work of Daniela Rosner and her new book that's recently come out. And she talks about you know, um, moving to alliances, recuperations, um, interferences and extensions in contrast to individualism, objectivism, universalism, and solutionism. Uh, the next example is uh, from the Design Justice Network. Um, and this is a concept of design justice um, that has 10 principles. Um, not sure if you can read them. Oh, well, yeah, you can, you can read them. Um, and, and it's the idea of really taking, you know, specifically looking at um, black feminist writing and concepts such as intersectionality and the matrix of domination and sort of seeing what that might mean um, in design principles. And they have uh, a free zine that you can download to read more about the kinds of design practices that they're suggesting. Um, and lastly, um, uh, Jeff and Shawen Barzell's work or I think in this case it was Shawin and Jeff's work, uh, a feminist HCI paper. Um, and they talk about um, having this deliberate commitment to both scientific and moral object, uh, objectivities, um, connect to feminist theory, uh, commitment to their methodology, uh, their empathic relationship with research participants, really focusing on understanding um, the exper experiences of participants. Um, you know, having a reflection about who you are when you're doing the research, um, co-constructing and collaborating um, more broadly about your core research goals, um, and deliberately bringing in diverse and mix, mixed methods to support dialectic information gathering. And they're both trained as humanities scholars, but now very much at Indiana University working in the HCI or informatics um, area. So with that, um, I'll close um, you know, the formal comments. I would still love to read you the field note from the future, um, or, or I can send it to you, um, and I'll take questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Falano. I have a microphone that's not for sound purposes, but for recording purposes. So if we have questions, you can just raise your hand. I'll get you the mic, and we can uh, start the conversation. Um, out of curiosity, what did you major in in undergrad and what kind of masters do you have? <laughs> um, well, so in undergrad, I had a self-determined major, which means that I was able to take whatever classes I want, but I um, was able to argue uh, that most of my work was falling under actually Asian studies, um, but my school did not yet have an Asian studies program, and I, I took studio art um, and traveled and lived in Japan for one year. Um, and then I did a master's in public policy 
um, and at the time looked at science and technology po policy in particular, and then moved on to my PhD in communications. Um, and while I was doing the PhD, I actually started teaching in a design program for about five years, and that's how I kind of made my way into design. Yeah. So I was really interested in the uh, Bauhaus uh, diagrams that you showed. Mm -hmm. um, and <clears throat> probably, those, well, I think those diagrams, for many of us who studied architecture, art, and design in the last 50 years, had a direct impact on us. The original Bauhaus diagram mm -hmm. is, I know that my basic design, and maybe even all the way through my graduate degree, was was framed around this idea of of design and making as um, the person in which is doing it is kind of the the liberal subject, right? It's like I, I'm an independent mind working on material and what I put into it, I get directly out of it. Mm. So it's like, it's almost, you know, it's a binary relationship. And I look at, I guess the profession now, I look at designers and craftspeople who do this and I'm also realizing that that diagram is changing under our feet quickly. Um, and the, the, one I, the one that was on the left, that was the reimagined one, what seems to be incredibly clear and accurate. But I, my question for you is, is what happens in those disciplines that are about making when it's no longer a singular experience, that it's, an, it's a network experience. And how, how are we gonna be able to reorient ourselves? I mean, I, mm -hmm. and it's a huge question, but I, I'm struggling with it. Like I, everything that we teach and we do is, is kind of about that, but is that gonna be here? Mm -hmm. Is it just gonna be like a, a novelty and a, and a you know, leisure time thing? I, yeah. I don't know if my question's clear, but yeah. I'm I'm struggling with how we transition to that like to a post human craft. What does mm. that even mean and how mm -hmm. how do we and more importantly, how do we begin as a collective profession to reorient either academic institutions or our own practices to think about that? And I I heard some of the strategies, but I'm hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think where I'm best situated is really in this area of like design anthropology that is trying to bring the critical discourses from social science humanities together with more generative and future oriented um, conversations that are about speculative or imaginative ways of working. Um, so definitely uh, experimental methodologies. Um, and I think, you know, part of it is, you know, so for example, at the Institute of Design where I teach, our curriculum is very much um, organized around methods, um, primarily around methods. There's very little in the way of theory or history in the curriculum. And I know other schools might, might be different. I mean, it might be that everyone has to take a kind of design or architecture history as part of the, the um, curriculum. But I think that, that that overwhelming focus on methods is quite problematic and that we have to either find ways of teaching teaching theory along with methods and i think it's quite difficult to do in any given class i mean you have a you know one of my classes about principles and methods of user research and i've tried to introduce some of these ideas around the post human because we can't only talk about individual users anymore it just doesn't make sense um, and of course, there will some be some client projects and, in which you might have to scope it that way. But in terms of an educational curriculum, it's very limiting. Um, and so I think it's, it's going to be a lot about these developing integrated practices. So how can you know, universities have courses in which multiple skill sets are, are involved so that you can have some of that knowledge sharing happening you know, without having all of it have to, have to be taught? in the course itself. Like some of that can be through the participation of different uh, people with different backgrounds. Um, it would be great, of course, to have more collaborative uh, relations among faculty as well. I think still, you know, a faculty member at a university is primarily focusing on building their own research agenda. And, you know, as they get more senior, there are more possibilities perhaps to collaborate, but not all disciplines are, are conducive to collaboration. And perhaps architecture and design might be slightly more conducive to collaboration, and the social sciences are, are quite 
um, still quite averse to collaboration. Um, so, you know, there have been experiments around the world, people doing co-authored dissertations. I don't know if that's really a good model, but, but it's an example of what a collaborative enterprise might look like. Um, so I think it's difficult, especially today, you know, we are in an environment of extreme neoliberal individualism. Um, and even though we're told, you know, we go on social media that we're part of a community or a network and that we're, we're ta taught to, to think of ourselves that way, um, the incentives are still very individualistic. So um, it's going to take, you know, a lot of reimagining um, to, to shift, you know, to, to different modes of working, different kinds of incentives. Um, yeah. So I have another question. Um, because you're kind of an outside observer to design, meaning you didn't necessarily come from that background, um, where do you think making physically is kind of going to be within this new age of technology? Do you think making by hand and that type of hand craftsmanship is still going to be around and be important? Or do you think it's kind of going to be phased out with the age of algorithms, AI, technology, et cetera? That's a great question. I mean, one of the papers I've written recently is on how do we go from a design studio to kind of a distributed design studio, meaning that designers will be working remotely and, and sort of sending kind of digital objects around. Um, that doesn't mean they wouldn't ultimately become physical objects or prototypes, but, but one way design might change is in terms of like working in more distributed contexts and using technology to support that. Um, another would be, you know, designers may not always be the person designing the object. Um, I think we've seen with examples like Nike um, and uh, Nervous Systems and other companies where essentially the designer at the company might be designing the platform or the tool that the consumer uses to actually ultimately design their own objects. So with Nervous Systems, it's essentially almost parametric design, but for jewelry. So you can kind of uh, go on there and if there's a ring, you can kind of change the shape and the dimensions and, and the entire form of it as a consumer. Um, and so they've had to design the app for that to happen. And I think so that's an interesting example um, where, where what is being designed is totally different. Um, I mean, there's someone still has to design like the Nike shoe, but then there are things that are customizable as well. Um, I, you know, I very much, you know, because of my interest in materiality and in particular digital materiality, I don't think things are really going away anytime soon. Um, however, there's a really provocative video that was done at Harvard that just shows like a typical desk, like 20 years ago and today, and it just shows how all the things that were on the desk became digitized clocks and you know so you you just see all these materials kind of going in but you know i still argue very much against um that kind of invisible or virtual um or dematerialism type of argument um i think let's see certainly yes the, the craft and and making um but but really i think designers need to be articulating much better the kind of knowledge that's produced through that process. Because what I can see is that as social scientists and humanities folks start getting really interested in design as inquiry and inventive methods and doing things differently, being that they're writers and they're out there describing what's happening in the world, I think that they have potential to kind of get much more quickly published about this kind of knowledge and that perhaps designers themselves won't actually bring that knowledge like into the discipline or create that knowledge within the design di discipline. So I think there's, you know, not that it should be a competition, but I, I can see that, that, that people who are out there getting curious about design, arts, arts practices, and, and these kind of things are starting to be in the same kind of territories as design and architecture, perhaps. You must as well. That's a good point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, in the video you showed earlier, you mentioned at the end of it that it was um, merely for like to draw speculative ideas. 
Um, on that note, that's something that we've been doing recently in studio, like making, drawing research and creating speculative ideas. Mm -hmm. But the next step going into that, how do you, from your experience, start to pick away at that and begin that design process or just, um, I guess, listing off the process that you need to go about? If that makes sense. To create the speculative ideas or? To, to go off of that. Like, I guess, how do you break that down, organize, and then move forward with that in your, in your experience? Yeah, I mean, I think it really just depends on what is the goal of the project. What mm -hmm. I see often is that students can become very conservative working on projects, and instead of exploring the full kind of creative potential, things like viability or feasibility, you know, tend to limit the idea. So one thing I like about speculative approaches is that they can allow you and give you permission to kind of push the ideas to like the most crazy that they can be. And then you can always, depending on the purpose, if it's an art project or an exhibition, you know, that's one purpose. Or if it's a client project, that's something different. Um, or if it's for, you know, perhaps you're trying to stage a public debate around, around something, then it can be a demonstration. Um, and so I think that, um, you know, the, it's funny because students will often ask how to, how to engage in a, a speculative design project, but really most of the skills are quite similar, right? So like desk research, secondary research, knowing the topic, asking questions, being curious, maybe even going out and doing interviews. Like there are lots of things that are very common in, in human-centered design that you can apply to a speculative design project, but it, then at some point, you know, the ideas would take a different form and a different tone. And I think that that's the difficulty is really getting the, the tone right or even the, the color scheme right or the music right. So you see, you know, sometimes like end of a semester projects or, or even, you know, professional design and architecture firms, you know, doing, doing projects that you can just, they're, they're just not quite the right tone or um, they don't have the, the, you know, in order to really engage in that kind of the, the supporting these kind of alternative future, um, possible futures. Um, so earlier in your lecture, you talked about the idea of decentering the human, and that as a designer, um, the initial outcome is the designing of people rather than the designing of houses or jewelry or whatever. So I'm wondering if your suggestion then is rather than decentering the human, is you decenter yourself as an individual in order to design people. And I guess the question is, after that, is does that create a foil to this neo-individualization, or does that further neo-individualization? Hmm. That's a great question. I mean, I think when I said that... <laughs> yeah, sorry, that is yeah. a loaded question. <laughs> well, I think, I, you know, when I said that we're designing people, that's actually, I would say that that's what design has always been doing. It's not anything new. It's that by designing things, you, you form subjectivities. A lot of people right now are writing about the ways in which something like a hackathon uh, creates individual participants who are learning how to be entrepreneurs, and they say it in a critical way, not, not really in a positive way, but so scholars like um, Lily Arani, for example, at UC San Diego, this idea of entrepreneurial citizenship, that instead of being citizens, we will all be entrepreneurial and, and neoliberal subjects, right? So in terms of um, designing, you know, hmm, decentering or, I think what, what decentering does is it ju just throws the notion of this discrete object such as a human that has permanent boundaries between itself and the natural world, it just throws it off balance and, it's, and it makes room for nature and culture to be linked and dynamic and relational. So I think what we do need to do is cr start creating languages like the cyborg, but maybe the cyborg already sounds outdated to, to some of you. Um, you know, it is a more kind of historical term, um, and it's also still in every science fiction movie you pretty much ever watch. But um, creating more terminologies that allow us to think in these hybrid ways. Um, 
So Arturo Escobar in his um, design for the Pluriverse book, he's talking a lot about um, the ways that you can, uh, he quotes the, the Zapatistas in Mexico and they say that, you know, they want to design a world in which many worlds fit. And that's one of the big um, differences between thinking about techno-deterministic linear futures and then thinking about kind of multiple futures, ways of supporting multiple types of identities and subjectivities, which is why I brought up that concept of intersectionality or even notions of critical disability studies. So I think that that's really what the decentering concept can do is to, to suggest that we create more terminology that we can use in design and architecture practice that allow us to think think in these hybrid ways. And um, you know, I think lots of people for now decades have been talking about hybrids, but actually we have to name specific relations and, and specific ways of doing this, not just sort of this general, um, you know, put a hyphen between everything. We need a, a whole new language. Yeah. It's a loaded answer for a loaded question. <laughs> um. Maybe one more question, and we'll call it a night. Anyone want to jump in there? I just have one quick method question. Um, yeah. Could you just parse for me a little bit the difference and maybe the relationship between matter of concern and matter of care? Because mm -hmm. concern and care seem somewhat mm. synonymous with me, and mm -hmm. I'm a little bit familiar with Latour's language yeah. on that, but I was just curious if you could just expound on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I think that, in, you know, it's somewhat new to me as well, but... You know, the idea of, of shifting from matters of fact to matters of concern was one about the social construction of technology and sort of the social, uh, you know, untangling like what a, a scientist does in a lab and explaining that the scientist doesn't discover facts in a lab, that there's, there's beakers, there's bacteria, there's all these things that are participating in the construction of facts, right? So there's that part. And this idea of shifting to matters of concern is this idea that captures the social construction um, aspect of science and technology. Um, where Puig de la Casa is moving to this idea of matters of care, um, and she really does go into very, very in depth in the first several chapters of her book, but you know, she wants to tie it specifically to speculative thinking, and, and so that's a very interesting move that's about generative and interventionist methods. And then care, you know, she ties to the feminist notions of care. And I think that, you know, again, um, actor network theory and certain approaches within that community have been often critiqued for being, you know, too flat, um, you know, sort of uh, believing that humans and things are, are similar and that, that are equal actors. Um, and so it gets often critiqued for that. And so I think what some of the new feminist writers are doing is trying to reintroduce the ethics and politics that might come up with, with gender, race, disability, sexuality, and other, other kind of identities as well. All right, well, let's thank Dr. Furlano for coming out tonight. And thank you all for being here. Uh, join us next month for another Humane Technology Lecture or next week for COAD, right? Thursday. Thursday. Two days. Be here? Is it going to be here, Jim? Yeah, it'll be here. It'll be here. Be back here. <laughs>